Hey everybody, it's Bishop Manuel Grady. Thank you for joining me on the Life Lifters broadcast. Have you ever thought about what we're going through in this day and time right now? Have you ever felt lost or like you don't know who you are, what you're here for, what to do next, as if you're in some kind of funk that you can't get out of? I want to talk about that today right here on the Life Lifters broadcast. Welcome to the Life Lifters Broadcast. I'm Bishop Manuel Grady. I'm so happy to have you come into our home today. I want you to grab a cup of coffee or something to drink and just relax. I want to share some things with you that's been on my mind during this quarantine, during this pandemic. And I think it's going to be something that's going to help you. And um, before we get started, I just want to pray and ask the Lord to just bless us in this time we have to spend together this morning. Father, I thank you so much for who you are to us and what you are doing in our lives. We give you the glory and the honor. We praise you for keeping us during this tumultuous time, what we've been through, what we're going through, and the unknown, that the unforeseen. We thank you so much for being a blessing to our lives. And now as we break open this word today, we thank you for your wisdom. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope things are going well for you. I pray things are going well for you. I want you to be encouraged because it may seem like things are on the dark side, the downside, but I believe God is really working during this pandemic. Now, I don't know about you, but I am really kind of getting worn out with pandemic and COVID and um, Corona and all of these things that have been upon us. And it seems like we can't escape it. But I have a word for you today I want to share with you. And um, I want you to get your Bibles and I want you to go to Exodus 32 and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. While you get your Bibles, I'm going to set up the premise of what I really want to talk about. Um, in past shows, we've talked about how this has been a time of reflection, of self-reflecting, looking inside ourselves because we've had time to do that. Let's face it, some of us are either on half time, part time, perhaps you're not working at all. But at whatever the case may be, you have opportunity now to really reflect on what is going on in our lives and in our world. Well, I want to talk to you about that today. So if you have your Bible, so let's look at Exodus, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Exodus 32, beginning with verse 1, and I'm going to read from the Good News version here of the Bible. And when the people saw that Moses had not come down from the mountain, but was staying there a long time, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, We don't know what has happened to this man Moses. We don't know what has happened to this man Moses, who led us out of Egypt. So make us a God to lead us. And Aaron said to them, take off your gold earrings, which your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took the earrings, melted them down, poured the gold into a mold, made a gold bull calf. The people said, Israel, this is our God who led us out of Egypt. Let's go back to looking at verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses had not come down from the mountain, but was staying there a long time, they gathered around Aaron. And I just want to look at the A clause because I want to talk about what to do when you go missing. What happened here is that Moses, in their estimation, went missing for a while. And when Moses went missing, Israel had no idea what to do next. And I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I have felt like I was missing, like I should have put my face on a milk carton. Um, like I said, in, in hearing all this about Corona, COVID, stay home, pandemic, quarantine, um, I've had it up to ear, but there, uh, there's, there's no escaping in it, but it's a fact of life that we have to deal with. Now, I'm looking forward to the day when the pandemic has no impact on our lives. We don't know when that day may come, but it has an impact on our daily conversation. And I'm gonna tell you something, as a pastor, um, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to come at this every week and have to deal with this pandemic and the COVID situation and somehow work it into our teachings or work it into our messages. And it's been done ad nauseum, as I said, and, and I'm really ready to move on. But the fact of the matter is, it's still here and we still have to deal with it. Now, one thing I do understand that after weeks and months into this quarantine, we've had to make adjustments. And making adjustments means that you are in an unfamiliar place. Now, one thing that we, we as people are very uncomfortable with is the unfamiliar. 
And I know I am because the unfamiliar threatens us. It threatens us with change. And then when we have change, we again have the unfamiliar. Now, in past weeks, we've been speaking on how to take time for personal reflection. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Have you ever been in a place um, where you have felt just lost? Any time in your personal life, um, it could be a sense of the loss of self. Maybe it's after a failure. Maybe it's after a success and you don't know what to do next. Uh, maybe it's because you made a misdirected decision or maybe it's because you don't have a you don't have a direction at all. It's a lack of direction. Now, I have to be honest and been and being transparent here. Um, I've been struggling with even looking at the fact, do I even want to go back to church? Okay, give me, give me a moment here. Do I want to go back to church the way it was? Now, there it is. Bishop said it. Do I want to go back to how we used to do things, the way we used to do things, the quote unquote, the organization of religion that sometimes can feel dry and done over and over again? Now, I love God's people, most of them. Um, I love God's people and I love what I'm called to do, but um, I'm questioning right now is there a better way to do it? And so I'm looking into the word of God and don't listen, don't believe the hype. Sometimes we as pastors and we as leaders, we want to turn over on Sunday mornings in our beds at times and pull the covers up and stay in bed. We want to go to 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 the park. We want to go to stadiums. We want to Netflix and chill. It is not always that we want to jump out of bed and rush to the church, but we are leaders and we have responsibility to do that. Now, we can now do almost all of that. We can't go to stadiums and gather that way, but now we have almost exactly what we've been hoping for. Now, every Sunday, we can roll over or we can get up and do our online thing as we're doing. But after that, we have time to ourselves. And just like Israel, just like the church in the wilderness, there are times I feel like, well, God gives us just what we think we wanted in order for us to be able to ask God or to get to the place where we ask God, what is it that I really want? What do you really want out of our lives? What are you doing differently? Um, you know, sometimes we as leaders, we, we want to turn over on Sunday morning and go back to sleep as much as you do. So the congregation gets to do that. And when you get through with church, you get to go home. OK, and you don't worry about the budget. You don't worry about Sister Sally and what's going on or the sick and the shut in. There are two types of people that worry about that church leaders and members that truly care about other members. But by and large, people just don't care about that particular thing. And so we have to see that now we're in a position where we got to ask ourselves, even the pastors, we have to ask ourselves some really hard questions. So many aspects, aspects of this quarantine um, brings back to my mind. Israel in the wilderness. And right now, as we're in a pandemic, that pandemic is providing us some sort of a wilderness. We're in a place that we have not been before. We are wondering and we're wondering. We're wondering and we're wondering. And we seem to never be satisfied. But um, sometimes it's not just that we have a sense of feeling lost, but we are actually gone missing. There are times in your life where God is going to take you away and it's gonna feel like you are missing from the status quo, from the normalcy of what's been going on. And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. And I'm gonna tell you why in just a moment, but I wanna dive into the story for a minute. Exodus 24 says that Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and that Moses was on the mountain 40 days and for 40 nights, he's on Mount Sinai. We can jump to Exodus 31, and the Bible says, when God had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two flat stones on which he had written all of his laws with his own hand. Now, let's take a look at this for a minute. OK, um, from chapter 24 in Exodus to chapter 31, if you go back and read it, God gives Moses instructions on the order of his church while Israel is in the wilderness. God is busy behind the scenes making plans. God is busy behind the scenes setting up a structure for something that he is going to call his church. Now, Israel in the wilderness is a typology. It is a type, an example of the church that Jesus Christ would set up. And God is setting this thing up. But to do that, he's got to cause Moses to go missing for a while. Now, Exodus 32 is where we pick it up. The people saw that Moses has been gone a long time. Now, let me put you in the frame of mind of understanding something. 
Moses doesn't know he's in the Bible. Israel don't know that they're in the Bible the way that we can read it. So 40 days and 40 nights to you and I, to both of us, uh, it, it seems like a long time to them. They're not really charting time with a, cal with a calendar rather and, and, and ticking things off the way that we tick things off. You understand what I'm saying? They're not, they don't have the luxury of knowing that it's three more days till Moses comes down. It's five more days till Moses come down. All they know is that Moses has gone missing and they don't know what's happened to him. But what is really going on on that mountain is God is giving instruction. God is giving change to Moses. Sometimes when we're going through stuff, what's really happening is that God is giving us instructions that we haven't downloaded yet. There's change going on in our lives that we don't understand yet. And we don't realize that the Lord is working behind the scenes. So our natural man feels a frustration. You ever felt frustrated because you don't know what God is doing next in your life? I used to say something and it went like this and I still say it, but what God is doing with you is none of your business. And that's an interesting statement because when you give your life to God and when you say, oh, Lord, here's my life. Take me. Do as you will. You don't know what you're laying on the line right there because we are so used to making our own decisions, living our own lives, doing what we want to do, planning our own plans. And when we do that without the input of God. Many times we are in, we're in store for a rude awakening. The people saw that Moses had not come down. And there are times, watch this, there are times when God has to prepare you for change. And oftentimes, because God wants to do something so significant in all of our lives, not just preachers or church leaders, but all of us, because he has a plan for all of us. Many times God can't share that with us because we have an innate habit of getting in the way of what God wants to do with us. There's been so many times in my life when I thought I knew what God was doing with my life, with my direction, with the ministry that he had placed me in, with even my family, my daughter. I, uh, I thought I knew exactly what the Lord was doing, only to find out after some time passes. And time equals data. And when you have time, you have data. The reason we don't have a vaccine as of this taping right now for the coronavirus is because we have to do testing and we have to look at the data. Are there going to be side effects? Are there going to be implications? How long do we are we able to have this in our bodies before we can see what those implications are? Three months, three years? We don't know. So what's happening is that we're in a place of the unknown and we do not as people like the unknown. We don't like the unfamiliar. We have such an arrogance at times that when something is unfamiliar, we think we have to come up with an answer for it. And I'm here to tell you that that's not necessarily true. People may, many times may think that you've checked out. Have you ever been in a scenario where your friends or your family, your loved ones, your co-workers, whoever it may be, I don't know what's going on with Susie. I don't know what's wrong with man. Well, I don't know what's going on with Angie. I don't know what's going on with, with Jack. Uh, he, they're being weird. They're acting strange. It could be that you are missing the you that they think that they know is not really there anymore. Transition is happening. God has called you up the proverbial mountain of change. When Moses was on those mountains for all those chapters, God was giving him instructions about the priests, about the tabernacle, how to build it how to put it in order. He was giving him instructions about sacrifices. He was giving him instructions about cleanliness. All these different things were going on inside that period of time that Moses was spending time with the Lord. And sometimes you may just feel like you're just off your game. I know many times I felt like I just, I just don't feel like me. And then the enemy starts messing with your mind, playing games with you. Well, maybe you're in depression and that's a possibility. Maybe you have this or maybe you have a disease and all kind of crazy craziness can enter your mind when you're in a period of the unknown and when you have in one sense gone missing. But I've come to tell you, beloved, it's not always that something is wrong. It could be that something is getting ready to go very right. And maybe you just feel different. Maybe there's something you can't explain about the state that you're in. You just feel different. Um, maybe it's a time of re-evaluation. I want to call your attention to Elijah. Remember, Elijah had a great victory in ministry. He defeated the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asheroth. And then this woman says, I'm coming after you. She comes at him with, 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 with an attack. She comes at him with a threat. Before you know it, he's hiding in a cave. And God comes to ask him a question. And God never asks a question because he's devoid of answers. 
God asked a question because there's something you and I don't know. And so God comes to Elijah and Elijah is saying, uh, take my life, I'm, I'm through, it's enough. Whatever translation that you read, Elijah basically is exasperated with where he is because he doesn't even know who he is anymore. When it comes down to the last thing I did, it's the best thing that I may ever do. The last accomplishment I had, maybe that's going to be the best I'll ever do in life. I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60, whatever you may be. And you may not see something on the other side of whatever you're on right now. That's a time that you need to be still because it may be a time of reevaluation. Let me tell you something. You are not required by God to have all the answers. God has all the answers. You are required to listen. You are required at times to be still in ministry and work. And those of us who are, quote unquote, go getters or those of us who fancy ourselves to be creative or whatever it may be. There is something about man. There's an arrogance and an impedance in man that thinks that we have to have the answers. And when we don't have all the answers, we really get uneasy in an unfamiliar position. All right. You are not even required to understand. The Lord will bring understanding, and generally it comes when we are still. I think that this nation, I think that the church, I think that many of us have been just too busy, too busy. And we have to be still and sit at the feet of the Lord for a minute. And sometimes that means that the Lord may slow things down. He may slow things down in a way that we don't like. Because again, when things become unfamiliar, they always become uncomfortable because we don't know the next move to make. You're not obligated to explain yourself to people. My goodness, I cannot tell you how many times I have felt compelled, sometimes without even being compelled, to explain myself to people and, 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 and why I'm not um, the same guy that you knew last year or why I'm going through this particular change or why I'm even questioning what I should do next. I know sometimes it is, it is so terrible to be in a position that you think you have to always have the next answer. You always have you always have to have the next program ready in church. And we got to make sure that on Sunday that we get the people pumped up. We got to get them motivated for this building project. We got to do this and do that. And that. Until after a while, we fall out of love seemingly with what our call is. When the reality is we have fallen in love with our own ability. Many times I say this, you cannot make major decisions when you're in a season like what we're in. If you're a pastor, if you're a business owner, if you're a parent and you're making long term decisions based on a short term situation, and this is a short term situation. Now, the scenario may change, but the specifics of what we're in this particular week and month is short term. I don't know whether it gets much better or much worse, but I know it gets better in God. I tell you that. And if you make decisions now blindly, basically, because you don't know what's coming next, if you, if, you, if you think that way, you will oftentimes make the wrong decision. Don't make arrogant. I want to say this to, to preachers and pastors. Please, let's stop making arrogant proclamations about what God is doing. Truth be told, none of us really know exactly what God is doing. Let's be calm if we can, of course. Let's, let's depend on the Lord, of course. Let's try to speak hope to people. But let's not pretend that we have some prophetic insight all the time of exactly what the Lord is doing. The church has messed up all out through, throughout history by making proclamations and, and these prophecies. Don't please, I don't, don't, don't send any more things in my inbox of conspiracy theories or prophecies of what some prophets said halfway around the world. My goodness, we understand that God speaks through his people, but now there are so many voices muddying up things and God is not a God of confusion. But we feel obligated sometimes as church leaders to say, ah, this is what God is doing. If the Lord speaks that and reveals that, then he will make it known to all his people. And I'm, I'm going to promise you this. When God speaks, it's not going to be shrouded in a bunch of confusion or a ball of confusion. All right. We have to understand that we've been wrong enough in crises as leaders to continue to do the same thing. Let's sit back and let's be humble. Let's pray. And let's say, Father, I don't know exactly what you're doing. But first of all, I submit myself to you that whatever you're doing, I'm on board with it. Now, that may be uncomfortable, it may be, and it will be unfamiliar, but I want to warn you, do not curse your wilderness. Many times Israel cursed their wilderness, and because their leader was missing, 
and they didn't know what was going on. They had no idea that where their leader was, was positioning them for victory. God had Moses in a position of instruction, in a position of direction. Had they had the wherewithal, the patience and the trust, the faith to wait on God to send their leader instruction, they would have been in a much better position. Let's continue with this. So here's the thing. Israel had been blessed, but now they were outside the familiarity of bondage. It, isn't it amazing? The things that we can get comfortable in that are not even good for us, nor is it good to us. Oppression often becomes a comfort if that's the only thing you've ever had in your life. Oppression will often become a comfort if that's the only thing that you've known in your life. Um, sometimes people who have addictions, people addic in, in addiction struggle because the addiction is more comfortable than the freedom that they don't know. It's like the old adage goes, the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know. You know, that's a ridiculous adage, but that's something that a lot of people unknowingly and unwittingly live by. We, we, we get trapped into bad situations, spousal abuse that are not good for us. That's not good for us because it's familiar to us. And so rather than trust God with something different, we stay in the thing that's familiar. We stay in the job that we know we don't like getting up on Monday morning to go to. I often say this to my congregations and to friends. I said, I want you to find, if you, if you were independently wealthy and you didn't need to work to make a living, what would you do with your life every day? What would you do with your life Monday through Friday or whatever it may be? What would you do with your day if you didn't have to go to a job just to survive? For the majority of us, I would say probably 95% of us, we would not go to the jobs that we have tomorrow. That's why, that's why so many people win the lottery and don't go back to work because they're just going to work for a paycheck. Now, they may get some satisfaction out of it. Perhaps you are in a field that you do uh, enjoy, but would you do it for free if you had the ability not to need the finances in order to do the job? That's called finding your purpose and finding your passion. And uh, many of us don't do that. So I've said to God, I said, now, I love teaching your people. So I don't, my passion is not waned. But the way that we've been doing church, the way we've been doing what we call church, which is really the spirit of religion, that's something I'm not in a rush to go back to. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not even mad at those of you who are, are saying, I ain't hating on those of you that are saying, you know, um, if I be honest, I'm kind of enjoying this little hiatus. Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Let's make sure that we're not using our lack of investment in God, our lack of concern for his kingdom as an excuse to blow back on the church. Because the Bible says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves. OK, now there's a difference. My good friend, Dr. Joseph Dutton, said this and I'll never forget this. There's a big difference between gathering and assembling. And I look at it like this. You can have all the parts for a car and you can lay them out and you will have all the parts gathered in your place of construction. But it's never going to be a car. It's never going to be the end product of an automobile until it is assembled. So God is not just concerned about us gathering. My goodness, we've been gathering for centuries. But are we assembled as a body? Are we doing any good? Or do you just get up on Sunday morning or do you just get up on whenever you go to your worship service, however you worship, and sit there and listen to some man or woman for an hour, hour and a half, four or five hours, if you're holding this Pentecost on with you? If do you just sit there and, and go home the same way until the next Sunday and it doesn't change you? No wonder you become exasperated. No wonder you as a preacher have become exasperated with that. Oppression can become a comfort. All right. And we have to make sure that we don't slip into that comfort there. Now, these people, these Israelites, when they saw that Moses went missing, the next thing they needed, they needed something to worship. So they made a God out of what God blessed them with. Aaron, number two, the brother who was left in charge, even the closest people to you can be a part of the dysfunction. Aaron takes, he said, tells the people, he says, bring all the earrings, bring all the gold, all the stuff God gave us when we left Egypt, bring it to us. And the Bible says that he took the earrings, he melted them down, 
He poured the gold into a mold and made a gold bull calf. And the people said, Israel, this is our God who led us out of Egypt. They began to worship the gift that God gave them to set up generational wealth. And the gift became their God. Has the gift of a building become the God to the Christian? Has the gift of the praise team, the choir, the way we preach, the way that we do our ministry, has the gift become our God? Because that's certainly what happened to Israel when they found out that something went missing, something that they needed went missing. They tried to find another way. They began to worship what God blessed them with rather than to wait to see what the new direction from God was going to be. When we get down to Exodus 32, God sees what's going on down there. And the Lord says to Moses, you better hurry up and get down because your people. That's always funny to me. The Lord didn't say my people right here. He said your people. He said your people whom you let out of Egypt have sinned and rejected me. And the Lord went on to say, I know how stubborn these people are. Don't try to stop me. I'm angry with them and I'm going to destroy them. And you know what happens? Moses being the good pastor that he was, prayed to the Lord and says, no, please don't destroy them. Now, I'm going to say something to you. Sometimes there are people that need to leave your life that you need to let leave because the very people Moses prayed for God to keep in his life were the very people that aggravated him to the point later on in scripture that he struck the rock, sinned against God and forfeited his ability to go into the promised land. You can let the wrong people keep you in wrong places and you will miss the right thing. If Moses, as painful as it would have been, had let God split his church, he would have been in a much better position from a leadership standpoint and from a personal standpoint. And because God loves us, here's what the Lord would do. The Bible says in verse 14 of this chapter, so the Lord changed his mind and didn't bring the disaster that he had threatened. And Moses went back down that mountain carrying those two stone tablets that God had made himself. And when Moses got close enough to see what these jokers had done with the calf, it angered him. The Bible says he threw down the tablets that he was carrying and he broke them. You see how easy it is to break the law? You can let people frustrate you so much that you end up being in sin. All because God wants to carry you away and show you something different. Be careful because you might be missing right now in order for God to show up and set you up for something great. But if you let things around you remain the same and you let people frustrate you, the whole point of God pulling you aside, pulling you up your personal Mount Sinai will be lost. You will end up missing God and missing his purpose. The Bible says he took the bull calf, which they made. He melted it down, ground it into a fine powder. He mixed it with water and he made the people drink it. Is it possible that God has us choking on our own religion? Is it possible that we are ingesting our own idolatry? because we're not willing to wait to see what he's doing with the missing components of our lives. The Bible goes on to say, Aaron said, don't be angry with me. You know how determined these people are to do evil. See, here's Aaron, associate pastor, passing the buck, right? He says, we don't know what has happened to the man Moses. That's what the, that's what the people said. We don't know what's happened to Moses who brought us out of Egypt. So make us a God to lead us because Moses went missing. They created a God. If you go missing personally, if God begins to do something in you, you don't understand because he's trying to pull you away from the crowd, pull you away from the congregation, pull you away from those you hang around with, pull you away from those that you spend a lot of time with in order to better your life. If you misinterpret that, you will create a God in its place. All because he didn't know where Moses was when he went missing. They create a God because we have to have something to put our eyes on seemingly other than God. And Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get out of control and make fools of themselves in front of their enemies. So he stood at the gate and the camp and he shouted, he said, everybody that's on the Lord's side, come over here. And all the Levites, the praisers, those that really had a worship experience with God came and they gathered around Moses. There comes a time when God does some separating. The Lord is not afraid to split his own church. He's not afraid to separate the wheat from the tares. He's not afraid to bring separation because we are in love with what a bishop, of, a friend of mine used to call nickels and noses. We are in love with how much money we have and how many people we have. If, if, you know, if I did have a nickel, 
for every person I ran into that says, well, how many people you got? How many people you run? How big is your church? If I had a nickel just for those questions of what was important to people, I could have financed half the kingdom, I think, by myself. Now, I'm, I'm being facetious, but you know what I'm saying. It, it comes a time when you have to let God do the separating. And we're uncomfortable with that because it's what? Unfamiliar. So the next day, Moses says to the people, you've committed a terrible sin. He says, watch this, but I'm going back up the mountain. I'm going to the Lord. Perhaps I can gain forgiveness for your sin. What did Moses say? He says, I'm getting ready to go missing again. I want to see. I'm going to give you a second chance. Me and God, we're going to see how you handle me going missing again. Are you going to put my face on the, on the side of, of a milk carton and, and then do something crazy and wonder where I am? Or are you going to wait patiently for the word of the Lord to come through this season? He says, while you're in this wilderness and while you're in this pandemic, while you're in this quarantine, while you're in this stay at home. Let, let me just take a, a sidebar to say here, you know, it's interesting. We don't really read a whole lot about what goes on behind the doors when God does the Passover with the deaf angel. Once they put that blood on the doorpost, they go into the house and they shut the door. It is my prayer that in that house they are worshiping, talking about the goodness of God and looking with great expectation as far as what's going to be great in the kingdom when we come out of here. I hope this what's going on in your home. I hope this what's going on in your mind. While you're shut up, because you can be shut up in the house, but sometimes you have to be shut up in your mind along with God. So Moses is going back up the mountain. It's going to be another 40 days or so. He says, um, the Lord says to Moses, I want you to go lead my people to the place I told you about. Remember that my angel will guide you, but the time is coming when I will punish these people for their sin. And the Bible says, so the Lord sent a disease on the people because they caused Aaron to make a golden bull calf. Now, I'm by no means saying that God sent this disease, but I do know that disobedience in man and disobedience in mankind gives carte blanche to the enemy. When we disobey, we give the enemy privilege. Jesus said that enemy, the devil, has nothing in me. The Bible says don't give the enemy a foothold. Don't give him a place to put his foot where he can push himself up and over the fence of your life. But when we give them a foothold, it's not that God has to bring disease and calamity and, and, and hard times into our lives. It's that we give the enemy a place. We let him have something that's already in us. And the reason Jesus said the devil has nothing in me is because there was no sin in him, obviously. But as for you and I, in order to say that the Lord, uh, excuse me, that the enemy has nothing in us, we have to let the Lord cleanse us. That means we got to go missing every once in a while, guys. Now, I want to talk to you about this. Exodus 34, verse 29. The Bible says, when Moses went down from Mount Sinai, carrying the Ten Commandments, this was the second time he went up, his face was shining because he had been speaking with the Lord, but he didn't know his face was shining. See, when you've been with the Lord, when you've gone missing, God does some things in your life and you have no idea what he's done. Um, years ago, Years ago, when my wife um, and I first came to the Lord, she had been down to visit her mother um, about 30 miles north of here in her hometown. And one of her sisters made the comment, and they, they called her Debbie. They said, oh, Debbie, you look like you're shining. Why? Because it's like the old song. Her hands look new. Her face look new. Now, of course, not literally. But there is a certain change about you, a certain spiritual glow that you have when God has touched your life and changed your life. That's what God wants to do now. He wants to shine you up real good. OK. And so Moses comes down. He see, see Moses has been with the Lord. He's shining. He's glowing. The Shekinah glory is on him and he doesn't even know it. The Bible says that Moses did not know that his face was shining. And Aaron and all the people looked at Moses and saw that his face was shining. Watch this. And they were afraid to go near him. Sometimes when the spirit of the Lord is on you, people may not want to be around you. Not because they don't like you, not because something's wrong with you, but because your lifestyle could be convicting of certain people. There was a story that Smith Wigglesworth was um, in public once when a man came up to him and said, Sir, Smith Wigglesworth was a great evangelist years ago. And the man came up to him and said, Sir, you're, you convict me of sin. There's something about you that makes me so self-aware that I need God, that I need Jesus. Now, that, that's extraordinary. And I don't know that I've ever known anybody that had that kind of that power or authority on them. But I do believe that it's available to all of us. There's just something about you. There's something different about you. 
when people say that, they can't always put their hands on it. They don't have the, the, the spiritual language or the religious verbiage to always know what's different about you. Have you ever heard or have you, have you ever been in a place um, where you were supposed to be perhaps as a kid and somebody says, you ain't got no business being here. Or maybe maybe you've left the Lord after knowing the Lord. You go back trying to club again. I don't know why you do that. You don't even know the new dances. You don't know the new songs. But you go back and try to club again. You go back to the same places that you used to go to. And, and somebody calls you out and says, hey, you ain't supposed to be here. You know, instead of trying to fit in, you need to get out because there's something that's on you. There's an anointing that's on you that's different. And God would that all his people would recognize that you're a peculiar people and you're not going to fit in. You're, 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 you're foreigners in a strange land. We are citizens of heaven living on planet Earth on a visa. All right. We are the kingdom of God representing him through the church and the earth. That's why the church will arise. The true church will arise. And so Moses is down. He delivers the Ten Commandments once again. And the Bible says when Moses had finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. You know what this reminded me of? It reminded me of where we are right now. All of us going out in these masks. I'm running into people that um, I know, but I don't recognize because their faces are covered. OK, what if God wants us to be so transformed, guys, that he wants to cover us with his glory to the point where people won't recognize our former mistakes. They won't recognize our former goofs. They won't recognize our former mess ups, not because they don't cerebrally recall them or remember them, but because the life we're living now is so great that it's outshining, pun intended, it's outshining all the dirt we've ever done. I don't know many people that have messed up as many times or as much as I have, but God always takes you back. I don't know many people that have made mistakes like I have, and I'm not just being braggadocious, but Paul said it like this. He says, I am the chief of sinners. And until we have the humility to know that his grace is so great that it, it reached down to the chief of sinners, then you don't know the real love of God. But I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to worry about going back and cleaning up what they can find on the Internet or these, these places. Says, well, if, you, if, you, if you call us, you know, that we'll clean up um, your search records on the Internet and what bad people have said bad about your business and all that. Well, you know what? That's fine. But guess what? If you go missing with God, he will make sure that the shine on your face will outshine any part of your darkness. That's what it's all about anyway. We have to be a light in dark places. But until we allow ourselves to go missing, and I mean missing from man, missing from man's ideas, missing from man's ideals about who we are, missing from people's opinions, missing from the manipulation of people being able to manipulate us with, I know what you did, and I know who you used to be, and I know who you used to run with, and I knew you back when. Well, that makes God's glory all the greater, because if you knew me back in my sin, you have to be amazed of God's ability to make my face shine like the sun. And so Moses comes down, guys, and he has his shine on his face. The Bible says when he came out, um, he would tell the people of Israel everything that he had been commanded to say. Verse 35, and they would see that his face was shining. Then what he would do is he would put the veil back on until the next time he went up to speak with God. Case in point, when he came down, it was so much glory on them that looking at Moses was almost tantamount to, as looking at God himself. And because he had such a presence of God on him, the Bible says he would put his mask on. The Bible calls it a veil. He would veil himself. But when he got in front of the Lord, the Bible says that he would remove the veil. What am I saying? I'm saying this. The mask is for men. But your vulnerability is for God. In front of men, I know that you may present yourself one way, but you need to present yourself in God's way. And if they can't take the glory, then they just can't take the glory. But if you ever go missing and God brings you aside to himself, whatever mask you're taking, you put on, take it off. Whatever you're wearing, don't hide it from God. That's what this whole time for me personally is about. I'm in a time when I'm saying, Lord, I want to tell you something. I love your people. But I don't want to go back to the same old boring church. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know what you're going to change. And you know what? I'm finally getting to the point where I am comfortable not having all the answers. All I'm going to do is roll with whatever God wants us to roll with. And I hope you do, too, because giving everything over to God is an expedition in trust. 
I mean, it is it is scary. It's unnerving. Um, it, 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 it really is an act of faith because you're no longer in control. You're handing him the remote control of your life. If you're if you're like me, gentlemen, um, I find myself, my wife laughs, laughs at me because I sit on the couch and I got this thing called remote control in my hand. I just I just hold it just in case I need it. Just just hold the remote control. Got to be in charge, whatever. You know, now I got one you can speak to, you know, fast forward 30 seconds or whatever. Just just holding it. Just love my remote control. Guess what? God wants remote control of your life. He wants remote control of all the things you try to be in control with as a man, as a woman, as a child of God, as a pastor, as a leader, as a businessman. When you give him remote control, then he's able to push the buttons of your success. Listen, I've enjoyed my time with you. I've come to the end of it, but I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you on two on two fronts. One, I want you to know who Jesus is as your Lord and Savior. And two, I want you to be comfortable with going missing from the craziness, from people's opinions. Let God kidnap you. Let God, let God kidnap you. Let him take you into his abode. And man, like Moses, when he sends you back down the proverbial hill to do what it is he wants you to do in life, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be all the better for it. And it's going to be a real good outcome. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the time you've allowed me to spend with your people. You love this world so much, you sent Jesus to die for them, for us all. And because of his blood, we have eternal life. So I want you to pray with me. Just repeat this prayer. Lord, I thank you for Jesus dying on the cross in order that I may have eternal life. I believe he is your son. I believe Jesus is the son of God, that he died, was buried, and resurrected on the third day. And he sits at your right hand, ever making intercession for us as our Lord and Savior. And by that admission, and by that confession of my mouth and belief in my heart, I am saved. If you prayed that prayer, you are born again. Welcome to the family. I thank you so much for tuning in to Life Lifters Broadcast. I want you to make sure that you follow us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, hit the subscribe button down there on your screen. Thank you for following us on Facebook. Um, follow us on Twitter. You can follow Manuel Grady on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram. We want to keep in touch with you. And for those who are part of Life Lifters family, I want to say this to you. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you. We're going to be better after this because it does get better. Thank you for supporting your church. Many of you have been supporting us and I thank you. You can put something in the mail. You can go to our website. Um, it's www.lifelifterschurch.com. Dot com. You can also go to Dollar Sign Life Lifters Church and give through Cash App. And we thank you. If you're not able to give because of the circumstance you're in, let me say this to you. God knows your heart and your desire, your willingness, willingness to give. But he's going to give to you and he's going to make a way in this situation and in this time. I don't care if you've been laid off your job, if you've been furloughed, if they've let you go, if you don't know what's going to happen next. I have been where you are. I promise you, I've been there. I wouldn't lie to you about that. I have been there in the natural. I know what it is not to know what's going to happen next. I know what it is to lose things. But I also know what it is to serve a faithful God that will make up for everything that the enemy or man can ever take from you. Uh, Bishop Manuel Gray, it's been my pleasure to have you come into my home and for, to let me come into your home. And until next time, I love you with the love of God. We'll see you next time right here on the Life Lifters broadcast, remember this, there is no life like a lifted life.